In the last chapter, we talked about the bacteria domain and the archaea domain. In this chapter, we're going to change pace a little bit and we're going to start talking about the eukaryotes. Now, when we talk about the eukaryotes, um, specifically in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the protist. And the protist is an extremely broad category. So this is something that has been the subject of a lot of debate among those that work on evolutionary classification. And it seems that there's no common ancestor to all of the protists. So really, we can't just throw them into a single kingdom. Previously, they had been in a single kingdom, but they seem to really be so different that um, it's unclear how they should be classified. So we're going to look at them as a group, but just know that they don't have a common ancestor to them. In fact, if you look at this eukaryote tree here on this slide, you'll see that we have some that are going to be quite um, closely related to animals and fungi, and then we have others that are going to be quite closely related to the plant kingdom. So keep this in mind as we start to talk about the protist. So on this slide, we have a look at a lot of different protists. Protists are very diverse, but one thing that you're going to notice about the majority of protists is that they are going to be unicellular. Now, again, I say this is about the majority of protists because there are certainly going to be some protists that are multicellular and some of them are quite large. So on this slide, just down at the bottom, we can see one that's very large. This is a brown algae and those are extremely large seaweeds that you would find in the ocean. So we'll have mostly unicellular. We might have some unicellular ones that um, live as colonies and then we'll also have some multicellular ones. Even for those that are unicellular, there can still be a large um, range of sizes there. So on this slide, we're seeing some of that. All of the cells that you see on this slide are considered protist, and you can see that they can be quite large, or they can be very tiny, like you would consider a bacteria to be. So if we just talk about general characteristics of protist, one of the main things to talk about is the fact that they are part of the eukarya domain. So since they are part of the eukarya domain, all of those things about eukaryotes would apply here. So what that means is that these are cells that are going to have a nuclei. And by nuclei, we're talking about um, membrane enclosed DNA. We're going to find that we have linear chromosomes. Another thing that we're going to find is that we're going to have a lot of membrane-bound organelles. And by membrane-bound organelles, this means that we have a lot of individual compartments inside the cell that will be able to specialize in various functions. So we'll have some that are uh, specializing in energy production, we'll have others that are specializing in waste disposal, um, just a whole wide range of activities and each one of those is going to function similar to what an organ in our body would function as and that's why we're classifying or calling them organelles. They're going to be very diverse so keep this in mind as we go through and talk about just a subset of the organisms and when we talk about very diverse we're talking about things like habitat. Very diverse in that regard we'll find some marine organisms, some aquatic organisms, some that are free living, We'll also find that they're very diverse in their nutrition. We will have some that will be what we call autotrophs, others will be what we call heterotrophs, and we'll have some mixotrophs that have a combination of both in there also. Their reproductive capabilities, sorry, reproductive capabilities will be quite diverse. We will have some that can only reproduce asexually, others will reproduce sexually, some of them will be able to do both um, a combination. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to start going through and talking about the various protists or a subset of protists. They are very diverse organisms. We can't really say that they had common ancestors, but we just kind of lump them together because at this point in time, researchers aren't quite sure what the best way to classify them would be. Now, endosymbiosis has played a big role in protist evolution and in the diversity of protists. So just to look at the word here, when we say endo, endo means inside. And symbiosis would mean that they're working together. 
So when we talk about endosymbiosis, we're talking about what we see on this picture. So very early in evolutionary history, it's believed that a cell engulfed another cell, and that happened to be a cyanobacteria. And this is what's referred to as the primary endosymbiosis. Once that cell was engulfed, it began to perform some activities for the host cell, and the host cell was fulfilling some of the needs of the cell that was inside. So that cell that was inside, that's what we would call the endosymbiont. So they worked together so that eventually they were dependent on each other. They no longer lived separately from each other. Now, it is thought that some of the cells developed into red algae, some of the cells that were like that developed into green algae. And then somewhere along the line, this process happened again. So this is called secondary endosymbiosis. And at this point now we have yet another organelle that's going to be inside that original cell. Now this gave rise to a lot of different protist lines. We don't know how many times this happened um, throughout evolutionary history, but it does look like it happened at least twice, once where the red algae was the first thing that evolved from the um, primary endosymbiosis, and then another time where it was a green algae that developed from that primary endosymbiosis. We're gonna be looking and talking about um, a lot of these organisms up here at the top. We're gonna talk about some of this down here at the bottom, but this um, down here at the bottom is also going to be very closely related to our land plants, so kingdom plantae. And so we will look at the last ones um, when we get to the plant chapter. Here's a look at the categories of protists that we're going to be discussing in this particular chapter. You can see that there's quite a lot of them on this slide. Another thing to notice is that we've got our land plants, our fungi, and our animals also in this same table. So you can see that we just have these protists really dispersed among the other groups of organisms that we have quite well classified. The first protist group that we're gonna talk about is excavata. And excavata inclu includes three um, subgroups within it. The diplomonads, parabasalids, and then the euglenozoans. We're gonna talk about each of these, but one of the main characteristics of ex excavata is the fact that these organisms have a deep groove, or they tend to have a deep groove, that runs down the cell. So this is something that's pretty distinctive when you look at them. And another thing is that each of the groups here is monophyletic. And the fact that it's monophyletic is fairly unique when we're talking about protist groups, because again, it's not real clear um, for most of them where they belong within the phylogenetic tree. So we look first at the diplomonads. The diplomonads a lot of times are known for the fact that they have two nuclei. And these nuclei are something that you can usually see when you look at one of these cells in the microscope. And so here we see one right here, and there's another, the second one. We can also see that deep groove running down these. So if we just point that out here, these happen to be um, cells that lack plastids. So since they lack plastids, these are not going to be ones that are able to perform any type of photosynthesis because they don't have the structures to do that. They don't have the pigments to do that. They're going to have a modified um, form of mitochondria. These particular mitochondria that are modified, these are what we call mitosomes. And these mitosomes do not have an electron transport chain. So since they don't have an electron transport chain, they're not going to be able to perform cellular respiration as we know it. If you recall from Bio 1, that electron transport chain is very, very important for getting a maximum amount of energy out of organic molecules. These are mostly going to be living in anaerobic conditions. So since they're living in anaerobic conditions, they'll have a modified way of getting energy. This is gonna be through an anaerobic pathway. They tend to have multiple flagella. And we can see a lot of those in this picture um, coming out of each one of these individual cells. And this is a good place to point out the fact that 
the flagella of eukaryotic cells, which would include the protist, is going to have a very different structure from what we found in the bacteria cells. So a lot of times you hear this referred to as flagella that have a nine plus two arrangement. And that has to do with the microtubules and how they happen to be bundled together. Eukaryotic cells will have that nine plus two arrangement. Then the last thing to point out about this group is that most of them are going to be parasites or parasitic organisms. So they may inf um, infect animals, they may infect um, other protist organisms, they may be humans for that case. So that's the diplomonads. You want to know the different characteristics of this organism group. If we move on to our next group, this is the parabasalids. And the parabasalids, um, we don't have as much to talk about that's real unique with these, but you can see that deep running groove in this one. Okay, see it coming down the back. They do have multiple flagella that you see in the pictures here. And these are also going to have modified mitochondria, but these will have a different name from what we had on, with the diplomonads. These are going to be what we call hydro, hydrogenosomes. And they're called hydrogenosomes because these are going to produce some hydrogen gas. So they make, so that will be make, H2, which is hydrogen gas as a byproduct or as a waste product of that. That's fairly unique um, when we start talking about mitochondria and the products that they produce. If we look at the last group that we find under the excavata, this is the euglenozoans. And the euglenozoans are extremely diverse. We have all different types of organisms here. We have some that are predatory. We have some that um, are photosynthetic. We have others that are heterotrophic. So just a wide range of organisms are going to be lumped into this. The big thing about these is that they contain a rod with um, spiral or crystalline structure. And this is within the flagella. So they have this unique rod within them. So if we look at this picture here, you can see um, this electron microscope picture of the flagella and it's showing you those crystalline rods that we're talking about within them. So if you took a cross section of one of these protist flagella, it is unique compared to the other flagella that you're going to see throughout this wide ranging group. Now we have various groups within these and the first one is what we call the kinetoplastids. The kinetoplastids are most known for um, what you're seeing on this slide, which happens to be the one that causes African sleeping sickness. And so they can certainly be parasites. Um, these are going to have a single large mitochondria, and this would be a normal mitochondria. It has um, an organized DNA mass, which is called a kinetoplast. And like we said, these are going to be mostly predatory, parasite, um, protist. They're very well known for causing African sleeping sickness, which is um, carried around by the tsetse fly, which is what you're seeing on this slide here. And you can see that the shape of them is just a long, slender uh, shape. Now, another group that we have within these is called the euglenids. And those you can see are named very similar to the overall grouping of these. And these are unique because they have their flagella within a little pocket. And those flagella within the pocket happen to have usually one short and one long one. And sometimes it's hard to see the short one if you're just looking at a microscope picture. But if you look at this drawing here, you can see that we have this very short little flagella here. And then we have the typical long flagella that you're used to seeing a lot of times when you're looking at pictures of cells. These are mostly mixotrophic, and by mixotrophic, this means that they can perform photosynthesis. They're going to have the plastids that allow them to do that, so they would have photosynthetic plastids, which would be chloroplast. And then they also have the capability to be heterotrophic if they don't have any sunlight available to them.